Micro Challenge is a global Christian response to the Millennium Development Goals. And, um, I mean, brief report, when in 2000 we heard that these eight promises had been made, and this was in the aftermath of um, Jubilee 2008, poverty history was just on the scene. Just a small number of us as Christians felt, my goodness, what an incredibly transparent political attitude to have towards the poor. What shall we do? I mean, Christians are right around the world. And particularly our constituency of the evangelical family, 420 million people. We thought, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could have a global Christian response to these amazing promises? And so some thinking began. And two global bodies uh, came together. Um, MICA Network, some relief and development agencies, about 300 of those. And the World Evangelical Alliance, about... 120 million people in that constituency, and then gave birth to Micah Challenge 2004, launched at the United Nations. And uh, Micah Challenge is therefore a global Christian response to these eight promises with two aims really. First is to encourage Christians to deepen our commitment to extreme poverty or to the eradication of extreme poverty, and secondly, and very important for us, to hold government to account for these promises they've made. So it's about advocacy in relation to reduction of extreme poverty with a clear focus on the Millennium Development Goals. It's been pretty disappointing so far, hasn't it? I mean, the goals, do you think there's any realistic chance of them being achieved within the set time frame? The one thing everybody is agreed on is that they are absolutely and totally achievable. It would cost the world $129 billion per annum to actually stay on target, you know, in fiscal terms. But the one thing everybody else has agreed on is that in the absence of the political will, then we won't achieve it. And I think when you look across the landscape, uh, there's good news and there's bad news. So food, scarcity, hunger has actually slipped back a little. MDG 1, partly as a result of the financial crisis, partly as a result of food scarcity around the world, droughts and so on. So that's actually had a very detrimental effect. Uh, we are trailing on things like environmental concerns, MDG 7. We are still trailing quite badly in terms of the amount of women who die needlessly in childbirth every year so that historically half a million women died in childbirth most of them in sub-saharan africa actually in the last year or so that figure has fallen from 500,000 to 350,000 but there's still far too many women dying uh, needlessly but there's also, also a lot of really good news around it's 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 uh, patchy but it's real. More people live in today with HIV AIDS because treatment has increased, even though there's still a massive battle to make uh, treatment accessible, particularly to poor people. 90% of kids around the world now have full primary education at their disposal. I mean, that's a very significant uh, development and a very significant increase. Uh, really good pockets of nations, even in places like Africa, who are on target with their own MDG um, aspirations. Malawi is a good example. So there are some real pockets of progress, but still an incredible amount of work to do. And when the New York summit took place uh, a few weeks ago in September, um, the outcomes paper basically expressed, and it's a little bit like motherhood and apple pie, frankly, it said, um, some improvement, a lot of work to do, and I think that's where we are. And why Micah? What's in the name? Micah is the name of an of a 8th century prophet, so about 600 years before Jesus. Uh, prophets like Amos, Hosea, Micah were great champions of uh, justice. And for us, we think Micah sort of exemplifies the spirit of what we are about in holding powerful people to account. The mantra we tend to draw from is Micah 6 and verse 8, chapter 6 and verse 8, and it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And I think at the heart of Micah, we're saying to Christians, we're saying to governments, there is a need to do justice, there's a need to love mercy, there's a need 
to walk with humility. So that's why we are Micah people. We've got a symbolic date coming up, haven't we? 10, 10, 10. Yeah, yeah, it's a great day. You know, I could almost be arrogant enough to say God specifically designed the 10th of October 2010 to be a Sunday so we could actually have this campaign, but we're really, really excited about it. And when we started thinking about this um, uh, two and a half years ago, there were a number of reasons why we kind of kept an eye on 10, 10, 10. Firstly, every year, historically, Micah Challenge globally, we have 40 national campaigns across the world. Um, we have a Micah Sunday, and it usually falls on um, kind of global anti-poverty day, middle of October, big global campaign called Stand Up, where hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of people stand up symbolically against poverty. But we felt that uh, it would be worthwhile tagging 10, 10, 10. Firstly, it falls two-thirds of the way towards the 2015 goals. Uh, secondly, it comes right in the back of the Millennium Summit in New York, three weeks after. Uh, thirdly, it's a Sunday. Fourthly, it's very memorable. And so we thought, what could we do which galvanizes the church, which actually points our attention outward and begins to help us to think about being a part of civil society, working in response to the promises of the MDGs. And so 101010 10, 10 is blazoned on our brains because on this day we have an aspiration to see a hundred million people praying the same prayer. We want to see 10 million Christians making a promise of what we will do to work with, to support poverty reduction. And thirdly, um, what we will do to take the message to our politicians, and we want to talk to 1,000 politicians around the world, not to beat them up with baseball bats, but simply to say, look, God expects us to keep these promises of the MDGs, and now is a great time to take firm responsibility for that. And so we're really excited about all that's been generated around the world. I mean, it doesn't look like a campaign happening around here, but actually there's an incredible amount of exciting things going on so all what around do we, us. So what do we need to do in this country to meet those targets? Well, I think in this country we have, we have a pretty good example of a government already committed. In fact, it's one of the few which has really uh, nailed its colours to the mast um, and said, yeah, we are committing ourselves to 0 0.7 of our gross national income to official development aid. And that's the promise of the MDG. Not many nations have actually gone as far as the British government, not even the Australian government, which was very, very warm towards that. It moved from 0 0.3 a couple of years ago and has promised 0 0.5 by 2015. So there's been a lot of pushing in that direction. The States hasn't come to that. Uh, or um, nations like uh, New Zealand is way down there. Switzerland is, you know, far behind. And so there's a real patchiness about that. Britain has set a very good record. In fact, you know, our Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister were very strong voices in relation to Britain's commitment. Uh, can I change my lifestyle? Can I give six months of my life? Can I give two months of my life to a cause elsewhere? Yes. Are there communities right here in the UK where I can plug in locally and ask, what do I do locally to support children in need, for example? Yes, there is. So there are a thousand things we can do. They can be very simple and they can be very transformational. But I think we're also saying that 10, 10, 10 is about going beyond our personal responsibility to make sure that we remind our governments through lobbying and advocacy that we have a responsibility for the poor. So advocacy is a part of the package deal as well. And do they listen? You know, Ruth, I think uh, uh, one, of the, you know, one of the $6 million questions is governments are corrupt, they don't pay attention to people anyway, why bother? And the amazing thing is we still vote for them. Uh, we still lobby them if they're taking away our child benefit and we want to do something about that. So there is a certain faith which we have for personal agenda. And I think there is no, there is no accident in the fact that in this country we have a massive track record of activism around these issues. Africa Aid, Live Aid, Jubilee 2000, Make Poverty History, and then a Gordon Brown in the middle of all of that says, this is an important issue. A Tony Blair says, this is an important issue. And believe it or not, a conservative government comes in, or a conservative Lib, Lab, Lib, Lib Dem government comes in and says, we are going to ring fence 
official development aid. Now, I don't think our government would have done that in the absence of 20 years of very vibrant and high-profile and sustained public response to these issues. And so I think that's proof that, yeah, government do listen if we shout long enough, hard enough and consistently and in a way which is informed, we can actually change government policies. The churches have led the way on this, haven't they? And um, the churches have been really at the fore of the whole MDG initiative. Do the church has been brilliant, yeah. I think that's right, Ruth. And I think there is an untold story of the church's transformational behaviour. Um, you know, beyond the child abuse stuff, beyond the the, uh, the spurious stories about vicars who run off with the money and, you know, the vicar of Dibley and all of that stuff, there is an unrelenting commitment of the church to care for its citizens. And it is no accident that the World Health Organization, for example, says that something between 40 and 60 percent of health care globally is delivered through faith organizations, primarily through the church. So we've got a good track record. Uh, the building we're sitting in is a Salvation Army building, one of the largest social services uh, um, uh, centers in the whole of the UK. And so Christian community has a well-tried track record of being at the heart of this. And Jubilee 2000 came out of the Christian community and became a flagship for community response to, to poverty. What would be your last message then to people wanting to join in on Sunday? I would say we want this to be a day which transforms us as individuals. I would say we want this to be a day when the church rises up massively to be conscious about the fact that God expects us to do justice, to love mercy and walk with humility. And the very exciting thing is that if you are in your local church or in your house and you are praying our prayer, making your promise, and you are thinking about your handprint and visiting your politician, you are one of a hundred million people around the world praying this prayer and becoming very, very excited about the church on the front foot doing something about extreme poverty and holding our nations and ourselves responsible for the promises we've made.